I started out with a wife and we had a baby. Changed everything. This is, I, you probably can't see it, but this was us when we just had our first baby. I had hair. <laughs> I had a lot of hair. Before I was married, it was down on my shoulders because that was back in the hippie days, you know. So I did have hair at one time. And uh, so I, I wanted to, the number one question, oh, well, I'll show you this picture too. That was 44 years ago. This is today, you can't see it, but now there's, that's a picture of our 19 grandkids born. So, and I have to say that my credentials for doing this is that I've learned everything the hard way, but all of those kids are Catholic. And they are all passionately Catholic. And because of that, I guess my wife and I figured we must have done something right, and so I have shared with people what we did. And we, we really did intend to be radical about it. We never were normal. And our kids even said, Dad and Mom have always been crazy. Uh, we, I remember when our, our child, by the way, I am going to go through this paper. Yeah, just hold on to it, all right? We'll talk about that in a minute. But I do want to just say a few disclaimers. I'm not a psychologist or a doctor. I never went to one day of college. And I'm not an expert on any of this in family counseling. I just have done it. I've lived with a woman now for 45 years, and I think I understand them better now than I did before. And um, I've learned everything the hard way. And this is only a summary that we're going to talk about today. And I, I want to say the major part towards the end of this half hour for questions, because I know a lot of people have questions. And hopefully, though, in a few things that I share, we'll answer some of those questions, and we'll cover it so that maybe those things will be less. So I. My wife and I, when we got married, we, I was only 21 and she was 19. And we were both evangelical Protestants. We didn't become Catholics for another 18 years. But even as evangelical Protestants, we understood what marriage was. Not as a, co not as a covenant like the Catholic Church does, but I, we knew that a man and a woman were supposed to be married for a lifetime. And so we made a business plan as soon as we got married, even in the process, and it was only two points of business plan. We were going to prove to the world that we could a man and a woman could live together for a lifetime and stay faithful to each other with Jesus Christ as the head of their home. The second one is that we're going to prove to the world that you can raise good kids who would do the same. And everything in our life was focused on that. That was our mission statement. What I did for a living was not as important. Everything was focused on that. What I did for a living was done in order to facilitate that business plan. So anybody ask me, oh, where, where are you? I said, I'm a Christian and a father. Well, I mean, what do you do? I said, that's a totally different question. What I am is a Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I told people that all the time. That was our goal. I remember Al Cresta, most of you know him from Catholic Radio. We've been best friends since 1983. Do the math, that's a long time. And we were both just married. And we've been married a little bit, but... Longer. We had little kids, but we decided together we were going to be very radical and we'd help support each other. And we we're going to homeschool our kids. I'll get to that in a minute. And we were going to raise our kids in a very radical, countercultural way. And boy, I'll tell you, things weren't anywhere near as bad back then as they are today. But we still knew they were bad and getting worse. And we said, we're going to raise our kids very radical. We are going to live radical and be an example for our kids. I'm not going to let somebody else be, teach our kids. We're going to live a radical Christian life, and it's going to be the center of our life. Everything else we do funnels into that. That is the important thing that we're going to do. And it was very fun because now Al, I think, has 18 grandchildren, and he is, uh, with all of his kids now, they're all marvelously Catholic, too. And we said, you know what, Al, our scheme, we plotted against them. It worked. Now, I'm not saying that to make anybody feel bad. There's no perfect families. And we had a daughter that decided she didn't want to be Catholic and took off for eight years. It can happen to anybody. Not all families are different. You cannot control the kids. It's like God gives them free will, and I had to respect their free will, too. I remember when my daughter, she was 18, she decided, Dad, 
I don't think I'm going to be a Catholic. I, she wouldn't have a problem as her older two brother, brother and sister were very Catholic, and she didn't want to be held to that standard. So the best thing was just squirt out and say, I'm not going to do it at all. And I said to her, shut up. I said, that's fine. You're a very smart girl, so I have no problem knowing. Because you're so smart, I know you'll be back, and it won't take you long. And if you're not, then you're not as smart as I'm giving you credit for. <laughs> And we just continued to love her and be a good example. I didn't push it. I didn't shove it at her. And uh, eight years later, we started seeing on Facebook that she's picketing an abortion clinic since she decided to go to confession. So she should go back to mass. And then she was on fire more than just about anybody. And she said, but just don't tell dad. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm just talking to you from experience. And all families are different. There's success stories. There's not success stories. People say, Steve, you're just lucky. Well, I probably am. I'm probably blessed and lucky. But I also have to say that we intentionally decided to do what we were going to do. We always viewed our family as a club. And I told our kids right from the beginning, this is a family club. Nobody can join this club. You have to be born into it, and you're damn lucky you're in it. Because this is a cool club. We're going to have fun. We're going to be have fun together, we're going to be loyal to each other, you know when you get older you're part of the club and then your kids will be part of the club too and we're going to have a good time together and don't you ever do anything stupid and get kicked out of this club they wanted to be a part of that whole story that was being written, or I also have always explained it as a great master work painting on the wall of a great canvas and we're painting it together as a family and we make mistakes and we go back and fix it and we get the rank oils and paints and we go and we fix it with the right out of paints and someday I said to the kids, this is going to be our masterpiece and I want to see it hanging in the halls of heaven. I want God someday to look at our family and see that artwork and say that's what it was supposed to be. So I set the bar high for our kids right from the beginning. I set the standards very high. We are going to live this way. You are going to live this way, but it's going to be a darn lot of fun. We're going to have fun being Christians. And we did. We had a lot of fun. And we made it fun. Everything we did was around that. And I remember the kids would, my, my wife, the Jehovah's Witnesses, would come to the door and knock. And I'd be at work that day. And she'd say, oh, of course we'd love to study with you. We're very open to learning more. And I'd get home and she'd say, Steve, the Jehovah's Witnesses are coming on Tuesday. And what, and what were the kids' reactions? Oh, cool. Dan's going to argue with them. They would line and sit up on the floor, and they wouldn't miss one word of that. And then the Mormons came the next week. And then we've had some atheists come in, and we debated them. And then we started a Bible study in our house, and the kids wanted to be part of prepping it, and we did fun things in the Bible study. So we always treated our kids as equals, and we always treated that they were always included in what we were doing, and it was always going to be fun. It wasn't just going to church on Sunday and leave it up to the CCD teacher to teach the kids. No, this was our job. And I remember my wife, in 1977, we had Cindy. And in 1978, she said, Steve, this girl's never going to go to public schools. She said, they, one out of five graduate, they can't read. And all of them are graduating now thinking that they crawled out of the muck. And my kid's going to know my kids, that they were made in the image of God. And so it was illegal in Michigan. And this is how radical we were in every way. It was illegal in Michigan. They were taking kids away from their parents, putting the parents in jail, and putting the kids in foster homes for educational neglect. This was in Michigan in the 80s. We moved out to the country. We bought an old farmhouse way the heck out in the country. And we disappeared for eight years and homeschooled our kids. Nobody even knew that we existed. When the school bus came by, I told the kids, you have to come in at 3 o'clock because the big yellow dragon is going to go down the road and the children. <laughs> they knew I was being funny about it, but they also knew my point. And they, at all of them, went through a period of, I don't want to do homeschooling, look what we're missing out on, but all of them now thank us, and they're all homeschooling our grandkids. The, there were so many things I, to begin, I just, my, I, my grandson, when I first gave this talk, right, his name is Sebastian, he was 10 years old, I said, Sebastian, I'm going to talk to people about how to keep their kids Catholic. What should I tell them? This 10-year-old kid said, it's my grandson, he said, pray with them, teach them, but if you don't practice it, they will fall away. This 10-year-old kid told me that. If you don't practice it, they will fall away. In other words, I've come to the conclusion that kids will love what their parents love. Not always. 
But if a father spends all of his free time sitting on the television, drinking beer, and eating potato chips, and watching sports, what are his kids going to do? They're probably going to do the same thing. If you love the Lord and you evangelize, my dad was this way. I remember this is probably how I got it. I got it from my dad because he had just from a pagan, beer-drinking, cigarette-smoking, chasing-around kind of a guy. 1953, he became saved, and one moment he dropped all of that, and, and I was born a year later, and my dad used to hand out tracts to everybody, and he talked to everybody about the Lord. And one time at, a, at an ice cream store, he bought two ice creams, and he saw a poor man sitting on the ground behind the ice cream store. And he says, come with me, Steve, and he sat down on the ground next to that man by the dumpster and said, sir, would you like an ice cream? And the man said, yes, I would. My dad says, good. Enjoy that ice cream, and while you eat it, let me tell you about Jesus. This is the way my dad raised me. He taught us to do that. He had tracks in his pocket everywhere he went. He was giving people tracks about Jesus, loaning him money, praying for him everywhere we went. And so that's what I did with our kids. And Janet came right along with me because she was excited about it too. And so this is the way we raised our kids. And I think it's raise up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And that's not a promise. It's a proverb. It's a statistical statement. If you raise up a child in the way he should go, in the long run, it's a pretty good chance he's going to stick with it. So I'm going to just do some... Uh, I'm, I want to watch that I don't go past 20 after, so we have a lot of time for questions. So, And I want to deal first with raising kids and so that they will stay Catholic, or hopefully will. And then I want to do what happens with those who, who left. And now what do we do? We're in a mess. And I bet you there's, for every one in here that's here to hear about how to keep kids Catholic, there's nine in here that are here to find out what to do about the kids that didn't stay Catholic. So I'm going to treat you all fairly as best we can, okay? So I want to just touch on some of these first. And um, this is the number one question I get in conferences, so I know how important it is. Now, first of all, in a family, the best thing you can do to keep your kids Catholic and solid citizens is to have a father in the home who is acting as a father. There is no substitute for having a father in the home. In Detroit, there was... 50% illiteracy. 75% of the children in Detroit do not have a father living with them. And then you hear the statistics that the prisons are full of black young men. And it's because we're all racist, right? It's because those young men don't have fathers. I talk to a lot of people who work in prisons, and they say that I, when you go to the prisons, there's not one of those young men in that prison that had a father raise him. When you have, in the black community in general, 75% of boys are raised without a father. The Hispanic community is 50%, and the white community is 25% that have fatherless homes. This didn't happen back when I was a kid. This is something that is now because of the whole welfare state and the whole drop in morals that it's now almost an honorable thing to get a divorce and leave your wife with the kids and so on. It's a big mess. But the number one thing that, I've bought that we can do to keep kids Catholic and sensible is to have a father in the home who's a strong father and who's leading the family. Now, I know that's not possible for everybody. There are people whose husbands have died or they've left, and this is not possible for everybody. So we have to then make alternatives, like find good male figures for them. We just took a pilgrimage to Wisconsin, and there were some grandparents there, and they had a 10-year-old boy with them. I said, just your grandson. They said, no, he's just a boy without a father, and we've kind of adopted him so he can have a day out there. And so we can maybe find situations like that. And the number one thing a man can do for his children in that home is to love their mother. I'm not saying go, not go to church or anything like that, but the number one thing that father can do for his kids is to love their mother and let the kids know he loves and respects their mother. When our family, the kids always knew I loved my wife. And I used to kiss her in front of them and hug her and all this, and they and their friends would come over and I'd kiss her and hug her and say, Dad, Dad, that's embarrassing. But the kids were astounded because they never saw their parents do that. And they could show and demonstrate the love of a father for his wife and the mother of the kids. That's a very powerful thing. And the father also should be keeping peace in the home and controlling the family and not letting the kids be little rebels. Because too often in homes today, kids run the house. They scream and they cry and, then, and they everybody just, oh, I don't know what to do. And the kids get away with everything. And when they get older, they think they can get away with everything too. In our home, I was the dad. You don't ever raise your voice to your mother. 
You raise your voice to your mother, you say no to her, you have me to deal with, and boy, did they find the wrath of dad once in a while, and they'll tell you to this day they adore their mother. So, the father is the domestic priest. He is the head of the home. The men need godly examples, and girls also need the love of a father, because if they don't have the love and the appreciation and the father telling them how beautiful they are, and was sitting, I remember when my daughter started getting breasts, I think, you know, Dad gets kind of scared, you know, what if, I just grab my daughter, set her on my lap, and tell her how beautiful she is. Tell her she's gorgeous and I love her. I'm going to hug her every day of her life. She didn't have to go out and find some sleaze bag in the back of a car. His dad loved her. And she was never going to jeopardize that. And she didn't have to find the appreciation of a male figure in her life because dad loved her. Dad still sat her on his lap and hugged her and kissed her and read books to her. And right in the family. You know, that's the way it should be. And the father sets the whole tone for the family. One of the things we did, and if you want to keep your kids Catholic, is get rid of the television. I'm not saying get rid of the box with the screen, but go behind it and cut all the wires that connect it to anything. <laughs> we all have televisions, big widescreen televisions, and guess, guess what we watch? I Love Lucy, Andy Griffith, all the great movies from the past where they still, a boy was a boy and a girl was a girl. You know, if two naked women came to your house and said, can we come in and spend the evening with your children? What would you say? Get out of here. I'd say a lot more than that. <laughs> they wouldn't walk away very healthy. But as soon as you kick them off your front porch, you come in and turn on the television. And what are your kids watching all evening, most of the time without any parental guidance? Or they have their computer up in their bedroom and they flip on Pornhub or something else and watch that because kids do that. They're curious and mom and dad don't have a clue most of the time. We had television, but it was not connected to anything. We watched DVD, back in those days it was video cassettes. Do you remember those things? Most of you, some of you don't even old enough to remember those things. But now we have DVDs and we stream things and we have very careful selection of what we have. And it's fun because there's none of those nasty, gross commercials. And we can sit and watch movies with the kids, and we can pause it and get ice cream, and we can talk about what we're seeing. We have never, ever watched a movie where we didn't stop and discuss it along the way. I know that people say, shut up, I want to watch the movie. But I wanted my kids to learn how to think about what they're seeing and to think about how to evaluate. Don't just take it, but think about it. So get the, the most important thing is to get rid of the television and spend time with kids reading books and things. You know, one of the reasons I am who I am today is because my dad always had the same job at Ford Motor Company for 35 years. He never got promoted. We never had a lot of money. We always had a simple house. We never went on vacation. I didn't even know what a prime river steak was until I got 20 years old and went somewhere else. And I asked my dad when I got over, Dad, why in the world did you never get promoted? You were an excellent employee at Ford Motor Company. You should have been the head of it by the time after 35 years. He said, well, Steve, he said, I did get offered promotions all the time. He said, they called me into the office and said, Charlie, we got a promotion for you. He said, but I always asked him a question. He said, uh, do I have to work evenings and weekends? And he said, of course, it comes with a responsibility. And he said, well, I'm very sorry because uh, I have three boys at home that need me more than Henry Ford does. And this is the result of that. This is why I am here. Because even when I was 15, I was raised in the 60s. You know, every, I was raised in 73. I went through that bad time. And I would, I never did drugs. I never once did I do drugs. All my friends are doing LSD, smoking marijuana, doing all of this stuff. Come on, Steve, you're a chicken, you're a chicken. I said, no, I'm not. I said, my dad loves me. And I'll never do anything to hurt my dad. Now, if I hadn't had a dad like that, if my dad gave his life to his work and never was home, guess what I would have done? I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today or I'd have a whole different story. But because of my dad and mom, my mom decided to stay home. She could have gone to work too, and maybe they could have gone on a cruise once a year. Maybe they could have bought a nicer car without the rusty fenders flapping when they drove. But they didn't, and because of that, I'm here. And now it's rolling down to my kids and down to my grandkids. So this is how we keep kids Catholic, is we have a home. We have a family that 
emphasizes the things that are important, that puts Jesus Christ at the center, that gets rid of the television and spends time reading stories together. None of my kids have, none of my grandkids have televisions. All of them have TV screens, but they don't have television. All of them have, my son has one of those big minivans, a big Mercedes kind, because he's got eight kids and now number nine's on the way, and they drive around a lot. And the whole top of that book, he put bookshelves, and the whole top of that van has over 100 books in there that the older ones read to the younger ones while they drive. And they, this is what they do for fun. And this is what we need to do as a family because most of our kids are being educated by television. They're being educated by friends at school. They're being educated by their neighbor kids. And bad company corrupts good morals. Another thing is the father should be in charge of teaching the kids. We give it up to the CCD director or the teacher at school. Even if your kids go to public school, some people may not have the option or the money to go to a private school or to homeschool or something like that. But even if they go to those schools, the father and the mother need to be still their primary educator. You need to overrule what the teacher teaches them if you have to. You need to know what they're being taught. You have heard all about the Luton County in New Jersey and the things that they're teaching the kids today. They're talking to third and fourth graders deciding what would you like to be a boy or a girl? Next, they're going to ask, would you like to be a dog, maybe? You can, you can, if you really feel like going on all fours, maybe you could um, identify as a dog. Who knows what they're, what's going to happen in the future? But the father and the mother should be overseeing it, even if they go to a Catholic school. Not everything that, that's taught in the Catholic school is correct. So many people say, my kids went all the way through Catholic school, and they still left. Well, what kind of school was it? Somebody said to me today, a Jesuit school. <laughs> When our kids went to, we, we homeschooled them all the way through, and that was tough. Took a lot of commitment. Janet could have worked. She did. She stayed home and took care of the kids and raised them. And boy, am I glad I did because the result, her, her sister, I wish she never listens to this, has three kids that went out and just profited. Drugs, sex, everything else. And she said to us one time, we thought you were crazy for homeschooling, but we should have done it. And we would have had different results. So that, that is an important thing. Now, when it came to college, I told my kids, knowing what college is due to kids, I think the vast majority of Catholic kids that go into a university come out at the other end having lost their faith. People came up to me today, I don't know how many, and told me that, that my kids were great Catholics, fervent Catholics, but they went through four years of college and they came out on the other side as atheists. They don't believe anymore, they gave it up, no, they don't. I told my kids, you can go to any university in the country you want to go to. I won't stop you. You can go to anyone you want, but I will pay for these five. <laughs> Ave Maria, Steubenville. And guess which ones they went to? The ones that I offered to pay for. And I also told them I'll pay for the whole thing. I don't care even if I take loans out or whatever. I'll pay. I don't want you to graduate with debt. Now, not everybody can do that. My son has eight kids, and he can't do that. They're, out, they're doing a lot of work. The Lord bless us. I can do this. But I said, you have to get straight A's to get that. Kids will live up to the standards that you give them, usually. My kids all got straight A's. And it's not because they're smarter than any other kids. Because my son got a B one time in math, and he paid for the next semester. Because I'm not, I'm not tough dad. I wasn't, I don't, yeah, it was not fair. You knew the rules. You didn't trust it. He said, dad, I admit I didn't study enough. But this is the way we can do it. You've got the money. You've got the money in your pocket. You can control them to a great degree. Which schools are you going to go to? This one, this one, this one. And we made our kids do the first two years at the local community college so they stayed at home. That way I knew what they were doing and who their friends were, and I knew they were going to be serious before I invested any big money for them to go somewhere else. So the first two years, they got the basics done at the local community college near home, and they stayed home. And then after they proved themselves to me, then I, they went out, and my daughter graduated. My oldest daughter graduated from Steubenville. She graduated here with her, doctor, her degree in philosophy, and she also got her MRS degree here. Now, some of you know what that is. It's a joke. Mrs. She found her husband, Ben Brown, so she got her MRS, Mrs. 
Cindy Brown, and he got his PhD in theology. So, and they went to Catholic University after that. And the parents, so because kids will love what parents love, it's it's you have to be living the faith. You can't just assume it's going to come out all right if you go to Mass and send them to CCD. It, it has to be where you actually are living this yourself and enjoying it and having fun being Catholic. Just imagine if you go to Mass and, and with the kids and you come home and say, oh, man, Christ, he just went on and on again, didn't he? What a boring homily. And, uh, you, know, you know, these these people, it's not friendly. And, and grumble and complain all the way home from church. You think the kids are going to want to do that when they get older? And if the parish that you go to isn't a lively parish, doesn't have it. I know people sometimes live where there's not. I always, I am one who says vote with your feet as far as the parish you go to. I'll give you an example. We raised our kids at Christ the King in Ann Arbor. It was a charismatic parish. 23 men in a seminary at one time out of that one parish. They had life team. Kids come to the life team. They had parties together. My kids went there, and they said, Dad, one of the reasons we're Catholic today is because of where you took us to Mass. And we met friends, and they had life team, and they came to Steubenville conferences and things. Now, my brother, on the other hand, wanted to go to the local one near him on the other side of town, and it was kind of a liberal one, but it was close to home, and all three of his kids are going. And he said, I should have gone to Christ the King, too. So find a parish, because... You want to have your kids involved. Find a parish if you can. Get them involved in the, if you don't even have that, get them involved in other good things. There's a lot of things in the Catholic world today. Find them. Look for them. Um, the, the Steubenville Youth Conferences. We made great, to great advantage of those kind of things with the kids. Do things as hobbies together. I think number one thing, too, is to teach your kids to be rebels. Kids are already going to be rebels. God has built into them a mechanism that when they get into their teens, they start to break away from their family, right? They're going to go out on their own. They can't be mama's boy all the time. As they get older, there's this independence that God built into them. It's not a bad thing that they start to get independent and want to do their own things and go their own way. That's built into them by the very nature of who we are. But you can control that to some degree. You can control that and use it and channel it. And I told our kids from the very beginning, we're going to be rebels in this house. I want you all to be rebels. And I remember one time my son came home with his friends, uh, and he said, Dad, we went to the to the uh, Cedar Point. That's a big, uh, big uh, roller coasters and stuff. And my son had picked five guys. They were friends together from our parish. And they had what they called a babe alert. Sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? But what it was was that he said, Dad, we came up with a babe alert today because when we were at the amusement park, half the girls don't wear any clothes. And he said, whenever one came walking down the road, whoever saw her first would go, babe alert, babe alert, and we'd all look the other way. We decided that we're going to keep our eyes pure for our bride, for our wives. And so all of us guys got together and we made this club and we had the babe alert morning. And he came back one day and he says, Dad, I think I'm going to get a tattoo and some earrings. I said, not in this house. You're not going to, first of all. But why would you want to? He said, Dad, we want to be different. We want to be different and stand out. I said, so you want to be different by being like everybody else? Everybody's getting body piercing and tattoos. Well, how is that going to make you different? I said, son, if you want to be different and you want to stand out being an authentic Catholic, you can't stand out more than being an authentic Catholic. You're going to get noticed all the time. And that kid took me up on it. He got his first car when he was 16. He'd been saving money for it. I also taught the kids how to use money from the very beginning. And they got, him and his buddies went to, and he picked up his car, and he went and bought these two big sheets of plywood and put them on the car. And he painted big pro-life signs on them. And he drove all through Ann Arbor, which is one of the most liberal towns in, in Michigan, you know, university town. And they drove around all day with those big pro-life bumper up boards on their car. And he said, Dad, we never had more fun in our life. He said, that's my guy. He said, everywhere we go, they're giving us the finger. And they're all down there and like, God loves you too. Save the babies. And they so off to another street. He said, we never had so much fun. And then they came back and they smoked cigars in the garage and played cards the rest of the night. But we made Catholicism fun. Be a rebel. 
Go ahead and smoke cigars. Our kids, they could always have glasses of wine and beer with us. It's better to do it here than out with their, with people out on the street. It was no big deal. I remember when my daughter was eight years old, Cindy. All she was hearing about was this rock music, you know, Michael Jackson and all this rock music. And she, and she wanted to, you know, start wearing a white glove and doing, you know, all of this stuff. So I said, you know, the best way to do, to, uh, deal with this is to pull the fuse out of the bomb before it ever gets lit. If she wants rock music, I'll give her rock music. I said, how would you like to go down to Joe Louis Arena to a rock concert? I took her down to a real rock concert where everybody's smoking marijuana and I mean, we didn't get home till three o'clock in the morning. I had the youngest date of anybody at that rock concert. She was eight years old. I wanted her to see what it was. And she saw as we went out to the car, people puking in the parking lot sick, hanging over their cars, puking and vomiting everywhere. And I said, see, this is what this lifestyle does. And do you want to live like this? Look at what, these are the kind of people that come to rock concerts. Look at the result of it. And I watched her yet the day after. She was with her friends and they said, how was the rock concert? What was it like? She said, you know, it was no big deal. I think I prefer Vivaldi. <laughs> <laughs> I heard her say that. Because we taught our kids to think. I told, took her to places and showed her things under my wing of protection. And when she got older, I heard her talking to a bunch of kids because she's a professor now. And she said to them, I never did drugs in my whole life. I never drank anything except with mom and dad at the dinner table. I never drank outside. I never did drugs. I never had sex before marriage. And I'll tell you why. Because my dad taught me. He showed me. He took me places. I saw the people who do drugs and drink. I saw the people who do this. I took her down on the street in Detroit and I showed her the prostitutes, my kids. And I said, you know what they do for a living? This is what you end up doing if you don't live your life right. And they were scandalized by it. But I heard her teaching a class and saying the reason I never did any of those things is because my dad took the time to love me and take me places and show them to me and teach me how to think about morals in life. This is how you keep your kids Catholic. It takes time. It takes an investment. It takes a lot of energy to do it. Now, this handout, let's talk about this. They actually stapled it wrong. So if you just do this, and put the picture of Sherlock on the top. Now you got it right. This is the kind of thing I did for our kids. This is, and after this, I'm going to, after this, I'll, and we'll switch to, Get the kids back, and then we'll go to questions, okay? So this is something I made for our kids. It's called Viewer Detective, whether you like it or not, since you live here. And what I did is I showed the, the um, two possibilities. There are only two possibilities of how we get here. This is really powerful today because all of this atheism is coming in, this anti-God, all the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, we're none, we're none religion, we're just, we want to be spiritual maybe, but we're not religious and we don't believe, and we certainly aren't going to be Catholic. So what I did is I made this up for the kids, and I said that there's only uh, two possibilities of how we got here. Either we got here by time plus chance plus matter. In other words, matter in the universe is eternal, and that's all there is, is impersonal matter. And it's been eternal. And somehow, just by time plus chance plus random mutations, you and I end up here. Which really doesn't make a lot of sense. It takes a whole lot more faith to believe that than it does that there's a God who created us. The other possibility is there's something else that's e something has to be eternal. Whether it's matter, time, space, and, and chance. Or the other possibility is that there's something personal. A person. Something else that's personal that is the other possibility of something that's eternal. And then you start going through like I did in this, and I said you have two clues. You have the clues of the world around you. You're a detective. You see this world. There's, there's order to it. There's beauty to it. There's symmetry to it. You have a personality. You're not like a rock or a tree. You can communicate. You can have abstract thought. You can create all these things. You also have something that's called what I call the mannishness of man, a personality. God has imprinted in his own law right in your heart. You know there's something beyond us because it's built into us to know that we have some value above and beyond just the material universe. But anyway, I gave you this just as an example. So then what I do is I follow through on the right, left-hand side. We say, well, what happens if 
There is no God. Everything that's eternal is really just matter plus place plus time. And on the other side, if we start out with that there is a personal something eternal, how would that one look? And we follow it all through. And sh I showed, I taught the kids to be philosophers. They were, that were, they were philosophers. I'm not a philosopher, but this is philosophy and a simple thing that they can follow. I just gave it to you as an example. If you're raising kids, do these kind of things and use this. I would, that was just an example. Another thing is you need to always emphasize sexual morality. I always told my daughters that they were princesses and that they have a unique ability to bring new human life into the world, which I can't do. I remember one time, this is the kind of thing I did with my kids. We lived in the country and there was a station wagon parked in the cornfield right in front of our house and I knew what they were doing in that car. It was 12 o'clock at night and my daughter was in the car. And we pulled up behind that car, and I turned on the bright lights, and I put on the horn, beep, and there was two bare butts in the back of the window. And my poor daughter, she was like, Dad, what are they doing? And I just sat with the horn on and the lights and waited till they got dressed. And she said, what are you going to do, Dad? I said, I'm going to let them go home now. And I backed out, and they drove away. Well, do you know what kind of a teaching moment that is for a young girl? What are they doing, Dad? The next morning, she, I said, we'll talk about it in the breakfast. The next morning, she came down and said, Dad, I think I know what they were doing. I said, what? She says, well, we had chickens and rabbits. <laughs> and the chickens and rabbits do what I think they were doing, and then they had babies. And we talked about sexuality. And I said, do you think the girl in that car felt like a princess last night? No. Why do you think she went out with him? She went out with him because she wanted a boy to love her. She wanted to feel special. She wanted to feel like a princess. But did she? And my daughter said, no, she didn't. I said, why do you think she let him do that to her? He treated her like a boy toy. Don't ever let a boy treat you like a boy toy. You are very special. You have something God gave you to create a baby, a human soul that will live forever with God. No, but I can't do that, but God gave that to you. You have the special gift from God. Don't ever let a boy play with that. This guy, what if she's pregnant now? Do you think he's going to take care of the baby, or is he going to drag her down and make her rip the baby out of her womb? And what if she has venereal disease, gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia, or AIDS even? What's going to happen then? Did the boy tell her that he had herpes before he took her clothes off? My daughter said, yeah, this is, if you, my, my kids, I talked to them about sex before they were even asking questions about it. You know, our kids are going to school now, and they're teaching them all about sex before they're asking questions about it, but it's a totally wrong message. My kids all said, thanks for talking to us about that, Dad, because we didn't have to learn it from magazines and from porn and from other people. We knew because you told us the truth about it from the beginning. I was never shy to talk to my kids about sex. And it was far nice to live on a little farm because we have animals to be examples. <laughs> that always helped. Well, I could go on and on, but um, I want to get to, you know, of course, praying together, mass together, studying scripture together, having Bible study. If you sit at the dining room table, we had our meals together, and we would always talk about a Bible passage or memorize things together, made it fun, challenges and things like that. So I want to skip ahead to about those who have, this is a whole long talk I give on conferences, but um, what happens for those who look back with older kids who are gone? And this is not to criticize anybody or to feel bad. I could, my daughter could have just kept going and not come back, the 18-year-old. Blessed be God, she did. But there are many families that the kids have left for various reasons. And I, don't, I think well, the number one thing is don't beat yourself up. Parents come up and they cry and they cry in front of me and say, I blew it, I really screwed up, I don't know what to do, my kids left, I thought I did good. First of all, if you have kids that have left the faith, don't beat yourself up. Nobody may have taught you what to do. If you had hurt like you, he's got two, three, two little kids and one on the way. If he screws up, it's his own fault. He's hearing this now, right? Shame on you if he screws up. He's, and and it's, I'm encouraging people like you to do your homework. Learn how kids think. Be with them. Take them everywhere with you. 
Sit at mass and tickle your kids. My dad did that at church. He'd tickle my ear at mass. And even though dad was praying, was Baptist. But, you know, we loved to go to church because dad would always put his arms around us and play with our ears. And it was like, I thought dad wasn't paying any attention. He was just paying attention to me because he was touching me. See? And I watch parents at mass are so holy and their kids are fidgeting. And I think, what a shame. They could bring the kids along. They could bring the kids and make them feel part of it. Sit on my lap. Come over here, I'm going to take and, and my dad always had candies in his pocket. And if we were good for the 10 minutes, he'd give us the candy. And then if we're good for that. And for kids, that's fine. That's a good thing. And if you don't, and if the kids are bad, take them to the, to the cry room. And, te- and even if they're older, take them to the cry room and explain to them what's going on in the Mass once in a while. So you could talk back to them, explain to them what's going on, so they get excited about what they're seeing and doing. But anyway, you make a mistake, it's your own fault. But the rest of us, we you know. You did maybe somebody never told you these things. I, I'm nobody told me. I, my wife and I just were really serious and we worked hard at learning and reading books. James Dobson, I don't know if you've heard of him from Focus on the Family. He was our mentor. We read all of his books. There were many times that we were up until three or four in the morning because we'd say, you know what, these kids, it's going beyond what we know what to do. We better get James Dobson out again. And he's a Protestant um, family guy and he was invaluable for us. And I gave my kids, even Catholics, all many of his books when they got married about what to do. But the first thing for families with kids that have left, don't beat yourself up. What you should do is say, today is the first day of the beginning of my new relationship with my kids. I apologize, I confess that I didn't know it. I acted in ignorance, I acted selfishly, whatever it was, and just say, Lord, I blew it. I didn't do all that I could have done. I put myself too much into my career. Today, parents are going to say, I spent too much on my iPhone when my kid was sitting there demanding my attention and I didn't give it to him because I was on my iPhone. But whatever it was, put the past behind. Say, okay, the past is the past. I can't change it. I cannot go back and rewind (laughs) history. Can't do it. It's not going to happen. So what I've been telling people to do is with those kids, depending, there's so many different varieties and things that happen. If you did something that actually pushed them away or hurt them, you'll have to deal with that. But in general, let me say it this way. I think the good thing to do is to sit down and write your kids a letter. Take time to do it. Pray over it. Shed tears over it. Say, dear so-and-so, I want you to know and tell them about how they were born. Tell them about what you thought about the moment that they were born and how joyful you were at their birth and how much you loved raising them and how cute they were and how bratty they were at times, but you still loved them. And then tell them, I'm sorry that, tell them then how much you still love them. I want you to know that I love you no matter what. No matter what you've done, who you've become, or what you're doing, I will love you unconditionally. And I, you may have gay marriages or something like that. Obviously, we can't accept that. But you can still love them unconditionally. Across the street from our house, there are two gay guys who think they're married. They've been married for 15 years, and they live together across the street. The Catholic family that lived next to us when we were buying the house said, you may not want to buy that house because there's two guys across the street, and they might be a bad example for your kids. My wife and I looked at each other, and I said, we're buying that house because this is going to be a good example for our kids. Why? Because those two guys are men made in the image of God who have inestimable value before God, and he loves them more than anybody can tell. And so we decided that we were going to be there and make friends with those guys, and we were going to love them and befriend them and let them know that we didn't approve of their lifestyle, but we loved them. And in a short time, they watched our house when we were away, we watched their house when they were away, And it got to the point where Patrick used to come over and say, can I talk to you and sit on the couch? And he talked to us for an hour. And he started listening to Christian music and asking us to pray for him. We took it as a long-term evangelistic project. 
And our kids learn that you can love someone and talk to them and respect them even though you don't like their lifestyle and disapprove of it. And I know those guys when they first came to our house. There's pictures of, of, of John Paul II because we got to meet him. There's pictures of us meeting him. And there's statues of Mary. And we are supposed to be the enemy of gays, right? They hate us, they think. No, they didn't know what to think about us because we loved them. But we also let them know we didn't approve of the lifestyle. But I said, but even that, even though Glad you're our neighbors and they're good guys. So this is, even if the family has problems, like if your family is into the LGBT or something like that, you could, my point was you can still love them without approving of their lifestyle. And this letter that you can write to them not only tells them how much you love them and how much you care for them, and that you will always love and care for them, you can say, but you also understand our position about why we cannot accept this or that, and we will respect and love you, but we also would ask that you respect and love us. And then you tell them that you are unconditional love, and then I would say the next chapter of that long letter can be, I want you to know that I'm sorry for letting you down. I gave too much time to my job. I gave too much time to this. I didn't oversee your education. I didn't get involved in your life. And I should have been more of a father. And it might be humbling to write this letter. It may be very hard. And I know when I wrote my letter to my dad when I became Catholic, he was so angry at me. And you, I already told you what a great dad he was. He just clenched his fist. You must be splitting and sin and bachelor and even think about being a Catholic. You, you have no idea how grieved I was that my dad responded that way. My book, Crossing the Tiber, that I wrote, my conversion story, was never going to be a book. It was a love letter to my dad. I did to my dad exactly what I'm suggesting you do. I sat down and started writing a letter. That book started with, Dear Dad, you're the best father in the world, and I owe you an explanation. And the first pages I ever wrote were covered with my tears because I'd hurt my dad. And he didn't understand. And I wanted him to understand. Because I couldn't turn my back on Catholicism, but I also didn't want to turn my back on my dad. So a letter was the way I saw. I tried to do it. And since then, I realized this is a great way for a lot of family situations. Because it's hard if you go up to your son and say, son, I don't like the way you're living, and I want you to know I love you enough. It's just going to be very uncomfortable. And sometimes they're going to say, mom, would you just shut up? But if you write a letter, they're not there to argue back. And it gives them time. It gives you time to measure your words and what you're going to say. And it gives them time to, to digest it a little bit without being defensive. They may be defensive at first. But when you tell them how much you love them unconditionally and you apologize for letting them down and not overseeing and not being the dad or the mother that you wished you were, and if I could go back and do it again, oh, would I ever. But since I didn't, would you mind if we start again fresh? Would you mind with my apologies and my sorrow? I get choked up even talking about it. Would you mind if we start again? Because I would love to be more involved in your life and I'd love to do this and whatever. I don't think there's a lot of kids that would rip that up and throw it away. Maybe they would, but it would grow up. And it certainly is, I think, the best approach that we could possibly have to start to rectify maybe some of the relationships with family. Grandparents. How many of your grandparents here? Huh, see. We have a big responsibility to play, too. We can't be too pushy. We can't be domineering, but we can be wonderful, loving examples. Even if the kids are not being raised in the faith, there are many times that you can bring them over and do things with them and take them on a, out for lunch and go to a beautiful church and take them on a tour of the church and explain to them what's in the church. Take them to a shrine. Teach them to pray the rosary. Now, maybe their parents may object to that, but do what you can, but we have to respect the choices of the parents. But I know some grandparents that have snuck their kids out and got baptized. <laughs> we have some clout as grandparents. Sometimes, we, again, it's money. Sometimes there's money with it. 
I, my kids knew from the get-go that if you live by my rules, I'll always help you financially. You live against my rules and go outside of the bounds, of, you won't get a dime. They knew that. And sometimes as grandparents, we can do the same. We can, we can have, there's a certain amount of clout that we have. And, but I think that we can spend a lot of time with our grandkids reading stories to them. You know what I do? Because some of our grandkids are, have moved to other states now. I've been reading good stories with my iPhone with a recording app. And so I've already got like seven audio books that I've made for my grandkids. And I, I record them here, chapter one, chapter two, and then I send it to the parents, and the kids spend Saturday listening to Papa read those stories, and I make little jokes along the way. Sammy, wake up. What are you falling asleep, Sammy? You stay awake while Papa's reading to you. <laughs> and one that's really emotional is I read the book Heidi to my mother when she was dying, 100 years old, and my mother would make these little comments and jokes along the way with her dying voice. And now the kids have that story that they can listen to the rest of their lives with their great grandma talking in the background and asking questions about the story. These are things that are powerful, that are easy to do. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure. You can just take a smartphone, read a story. You just sit at the couch and read a story, a chapter a night, and then you send it on a disc and say, here's for the grandkids. I hope they enjoy the story I read to them. And this gives you... And in, even if they don't want you involved in their kids' lives, they're not going to mind if you read them a nice story like Heidi. It's not forcing the catechism down their throat, but the story of Heidi is tremendously a good moral story. So those are some ideas. Grandparents have a lot of club, birthday parties you can have. And I also, and I'm not doing this to get business, but taking kids on a pilgrimage when I took our kids on a pilgrimage, I've taken our kids a lot of times. And they will tell you, my older daughter and son will say that one of the things that made them love the Catholic faith was going on a pilgrimage and seeing that all those places are really true and hearing about them and understanding that, wow, Jesus was really right here. And they said that it's now we know it's true with a capital T. Parents spend $100,000 to send their kids to college where they're going to lose their faith. Why not spend 5000 and send them to the Holy Land so they'll never lose their faith? My, I think grandparents... My son right now is starting, building off what I've done, and he's just getting it started. And what he wants to do is, you know how the Jews send their young people over to Israel? They send thousands at a time. They charter planes, and they send thousands of young Jewish kids from the United States over there, and then they have guides, and they drive them. It's called a heritage tour, learn your Jewish heritage. And they go to the Western Wall, and Masada, and all of this, and the kids just get... It, it makes their Jewishness real to them. So what my son wants to do now is start the same thing. It's called the inheritance tour, what your inheritance is as a Catholic. And he wants to send, he get donors, Catholic donors to start contributing. And parents would only have to pay $800 for their kids and they'd go for, for eight days to the Holy Land. And they would go as a big group of high school and college kids and we'd get donors to cover it. And they would go there and have a heritage inheritance tour and understand, understand see where Jesus was crucified and buried and where the Eucharist was first put in the room. But anyway, that's a real good thing. My daughter, and then we open for questions. My daughter, Emily, was eight years old, and we went to the Holy Land once with her. She came with us a number of times. And, no, she was 15 this time, I'm sorry. And she was 15, and she'd been there before. And she said, I want to go over to the Holy Sepulchre and pray. Well, we always stay at a hotel in Notre Dame, which is only a 10-minute walk from the Holy Sepulchre. She went over with her friend to pray at the Holy Sepulchre. She came back an hour later in tears, threw herself on the bed, just sobbing and sobbing. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I should have gone with her. What happened? I said, Emily, what's wrong? And finally, after 10 minutes, she calmed down enough to say, Dad, I've been in that tomb of Jesus with you so many times in the past. But this time... I realized he was really there. She was crying because the Lord spoke to her there. She met Jesus in that tomb. And she'll tell you today she's never been the same because of that. And this is what the kind of thing we got to give our kids experiences. You don't have to go to Israel to do it. There's shrines. We just did a three-day sh uh, shrines in Wisconsin with 100 people. We drove through Wisconsin and went to the shrines. And what an impact it had. 
So you, you don't even have to go to the Holy Land. You can do those kind of things with grandkids here. Make it a fun day and visit some churches, visit some shrines, tell them about the saints, teach them how to pray the rosary in the car on the way. I remember my sister was a pagan, my older sister, and she had two sons. And she'd drop them off with my, with my mother. So it was my mother's daughter who was dropping my grandkids off with my mom to babysit. And she'd tell my mom, don't you dare talk to them about religion. Don't you dare talk to them about religion or read them the Bible. But my mom did. And you know what? My mom died on Mother's Day of this year. Maybe I shouldn't have said this. I'm not going to get it out. My nephew, the young man who was not supposed to hear about God in the Bible, stood up at my mother's funeral and said, I'm a Catholic today and a Christian because of Grandma. Because my mom wouldn't talk to me, but Grandma did. Grandma told me about God, and I'm a Christian today because of Grandma. She was my substitute mom. Grandparents. Talk to the grandkids. Take them under your wing. Love them. I know sometimes they're far away. Spend some money. Bring them back. Spend a week with them. Money is nothing when it comes to family. Money is nothing. Okay. I, I told you we'd ask, take some questions. Hopefully we answered some of them. Yes. So your question is just to what keep... What was a godmother for my niece to do? We're, many of us are godparents. And I know that we don't take that seriously too often. You obviously are, right? I they respect you. They yeah, they made a mistake when they picked you. Good. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I love it. And I, I am the godfather for several, and I have to admit I'm a negligent one. I'm so busy with my own kids and grandkids, but that... Kid is lucky to have you. I would say first that you pray for them all the time. And, and you know when we say pray for it, it kind of becomes a cliche for us. But I like to tell people this, especially with kids that have left the faith. Remember the unjust judge where the woman went to the unjust judge and he was sleeping? And she said, hello, I'm up there sleeping. I, I'm not gonna, I need justice. And he says, yells out, opens the window, go away, I'm sleeping. Wake up, I need justice. You're the judge. Jesus is the one that told this parable. Finally, the guy came down, and he was angry. He says, I'm not down here because I'm a good judge. I'm down here because you're driving me crazy. What do you want? And he gave it to her. And Jesus said, how much more will your heavenly Father give you what he needs if you're persistent? So I tell people with kids that have left the faith or other important issues like this, take a piece of paper and draw two lines and divide it into thirds. And on the left-hand side, put down your request, whatever that name is. This is what I want for this child, this, 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 and this. Then put in the middle column the date that you asked God to do it. And then put God on the spot. Say, God, this third column is when you answer the prayer. I'm not going to back off, God. You said I could knock, and you'll hear, you'll answer my prayers. I don't know how you're going to answer the prayers. You do, but I am going to know what I want done. And here's the date I asked, and you better deliver. <laughs> God's a fun father. You can talk to him like that. My dad was a great dad, so I always learned that I felt very free joking around and talking with God like that. But make a list like that. Put that down. Do everything you can when, when you're able to. Keep friends with the mother. Keep friends, do, do things for her. Take special things over. Give her a bottle of wine on her birthday or something. Because it's very difficult when you love her for her not to let you. And, and keep, uh, yes. How did you resolve your relationship with your father after you broke away? How did I, with my, how did I resolve the relationship? I'll say with our parents, because both parents would used to talk to us for a while. This is how good my dad was when we became Catholic. 
My mother refused to come to the mass when we were received in, but my dad came. But he said, Steve, I am totally opposed to what you're doing, and I'm going to sit in the back because I don't want anybody to know I'm part of this. And I'm totally opposed to it, but I'm coming because I love you. So my dad did read that book that I wrote. And our kids, I said to them, Grandma and Grandpa are getting old. You should go visit them and get to know them. So my kids, after becoming Catholic, went over there every Tuesday afternoon and brought lunch to Grandma and Grandpa and spent the afternoon with them. And that was only a couple months later, Dad and Mom said, Steve, you guys joining the Catholic Church, I can't argue with the results, especially with those kids. And so I said, now we're proud of you. I know that you are where you're supposed to be. Now with my mother-in-law on the other side, she was not going to listen to me. Her, my father-in-law said, why did you take my daughter out of the Protestant church over to that cult? You know, he was really upset. So I said, Lord, they're never going to listen to me. So I did the, the unjust judge thing. I said, God, I'm going to knock on your door every day. I did the three columns, you know. I said, I'm not going to back off on this. I'm going to come after you every single day, multiple times. You're going to get tired of hearing from me. A year later, we found out that my mother-in-law had been camping with another family, and they didn't even know they were Catholic. And the lady, they're book club ladies. And so my mother-in-law was talking to her friend Bunny, and Bunny says, Mary, I just read the best book you got to get this. Oh, great, let me know what it is. I'll get it, we'll, we'll talk about it. She said, it's called Crossing the Tiber. <laughs> <laughs> my mother-in-law says, who wrote it? She said, a guy named Steve Bray. <laughs> and my mother is just mortified. <laughs> she said, that's my, my son-in-law. You're kidding. Will you get me an autographed picture? <laughs> and I'm not tooting my horn there, but I'm just saying that's how God did it. Their family, from that point on, they didn't become Catholic, but from then on, they were proud of us. They're bragging about us because her friend. And so I say that there are six things. Let me, let me do this real quick. There are six rules that I've come up with that I've actually added seven for dealing with non Catholic family and friends. And there's an article on Catholic Answers Magazine. Um, I'll put it on my website again, so that if you want to go to it, it's catholicconvert.com. I'll put it up tonight so that you find this article. It's called Seven Rules. It's actually six, but I made it seven now. Rules for dealing with non-Catholic family and friends. And number one is don't argue with them. Discuss and talk, but don't argue and burn bridges. Number two, love them more than you ever loved them before, because you can't argue with love. Pray and make sacrifices. Really do it. Pray and make sacrifices. Show the joy of the Lord in your life. They're going to say, what was he spoken? I want that, whatever it is. If you're happy and joyful, you're just like, they, I want what they have. You're joyful in the Lord. The third one is do your, a uh, fifth one is do your homework. So that when they do decide to come and ask you a question, like, why do you believe Jesus is present in the Eucharist? And you go, I don't know. It's not good. <laughs> do your homework like you folks are doing here. Number six is have patience because God is not in as big a hurry as you are. And the seventh rule is ask God to bring somebody else into their life because they're never going to listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened to my mother-in-law. She wasn't going to listen to me, but God brought bunny into her life and it changed everything. So ask God to bring somebody else into your loved one's life and pray that every day and watch somebody at work, somebody they're going to respect a sports figure. And you're Catholic? Of course I'm Catholic. All of a sudden, maybe there's a whole new respect. And you should be talking to people about the Lord because you may be an answer to somebody else's prayer. Yes, somebody up. In the back, you've had your hand up three times. Yes, it's true. The theme of what you're talking about today is very much real. I'm the oldest of eight, product of homeschooling. You know, I, a lot of our homeschool friends were homeschooled because their parents really tried to shelter them from the real world. And then I saw many of my homeschool friends, including many of my own siblings, get to college and take a nosedive off the crazy tree. Yep. I seemed to hit every branch on the way down. Yep. Right? So I swore up homeschooling. No way. Now, I've got young children. They're in the real world, right? And I am disgusted with what I'm seeing. Yep. So what? I, but I don't want to homeschool because of what I. My okay, experience. here's what you do: you homeschool, but yep. you expose them to the real world, like I did with my kids. My kids, they told us your kids are going to be so unsocialized. When they get older, they're going to do just like you said. They're going to after you protected them and kept them in this little hot house, they're going to go out and get a prostitute the first time. They're going to get drunk. They're going to. No, that's not the case because you are homeschooling is not two plus two is four. 
Homeschooling starts the minute that baby is born. You teach that baby to speak English. That's a difficult thing. You do that before they're five years old. You're a great teacher. And you did it in the real world. You take your kids out. My son and I wouldn't take them to Boy Scouts now because they're all, it's all, you know what? I'm not going to send my kids out to a Boy Scout camp with some prowler crawling in the tent with my son. But, the fact, but there are Catholic stuff. So my daughter was in dance class. She ended up being in a really good dance class where they had to go to Las Vegas and do dances in New York, and they went, and we went with them. And we, my, I took my daughter down and showed her the prostitutes. I took her to concerts. We did all kinds of stuff. Our kids were the most socialized kids in the whole state, and they were the most exposed to the world as anybody in the whole state. The difference was we controlled their friends. And we spent our time teaching them about the real world while we were living in it with them. We would go do things. I'll give you an example. We went to Cedar Point, and that was a, and there was a big line to get to the roller coaster. And I always teach my kids morals this way in the real world. There's a guy way ahead of me, like a mile ahead of me in line, and he's got a shirt that says no rules. So I said to the kids, I'll be right back. <laughs> And when I got to that guy, I'd give him an elbow and I stood right in front of him. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking cuts. I said, this is a long line and I don't like waiting in it. And he said, you can't do that. I said, yes, I can. Read your stupid t-shirt. <laughs> Did you show him your no regrets tattoo across your chest? <laughs> But that's, that's what we did, see, and then I, I said to him, you know, it, so those rules only apply for you, or did you just not think about that before you put the stupid t-shirt on? But when I went back, the kids were so impressed that Dad did that. See, this is how in the real world I taught my kids. If you send your kids off to public school, you have no control over who their friends are going to be. They're going to get friends that are not going to be what you want. And once those friendships are made, it's going to be very difficult for you to break them. And there's going to be pornography on their iPhones on the school bus. There's going to be all kinds of things that you have completely capitulated and handed your kids over to. Homeschooling can be done really well. We just went to, I uh, told you, to um, Wisconsin on a pilgrimage. Guess who came with us? 25 kids that were in my daughter's homeschooling co-op that my daughter who's homeschooled now does. All those 25 kids came along with that and they sang for us at all the masses and they had a blast together. They did all kinds of stuff. They went out to restaurants, they went walking in the It was We exposed our kids to the world but we controlled the exposure. And then we had all kinds of fun together, baseball games, everything else. And we had homeschooling friends and families that we did things with on the weekends. Now it's really nice because my daughter's part, she started a homeschooling co-op with 150 kids. And they do things that they have sports clubs now with other homeschooling co-ops and they're competing in sports. They're doing Shakespeare plays. They are the most exposed to the things of the world that are good that you can get, but they're not gonna be exposed to the bad things, but they are taught about the bad things. And so this I'd say the parents have to be at the very heart of education. Some people may have to send their kids to public school. They may not have money to do otherwise. Or Catholic schools. Sometimes in Catholic schools is no better. There are good ones and there are really, really bad ones. And sometimes the Catholic school can be worse because the kids can't tell who the enemy really is. In a public school, at least you know who the enemy is. In a Catholic school, you're learning this from your teacher and they're Catholic and they're teaching you these things. It's, it's so hard to know who the enemy is. I'm almost rather not if it's a bad Catholic school. But anyway, the father and the mother are, should be in charge. Yes, go ahead. He's the one with the kids, and I already gave him a hard time, so I'll let him ask a question. Uh, in addition to my, my own family, and I will acknowledge that the most important thing is for me to live this in my own family, but I'm also a pediatrician. And so I see the, especially as a father of this institute, so I really appreciate you talking about that. And so one of the things that God has placed on my heart is to... He's a pediatrician, and he sees what we're talking about in the office. To try to speak to dads and to like create a ministry or, or a platform to try to encourage dads to step into the lives of their children and to be present and to find the joy in fatherhood. Yep. So I'm trying to build that Good for you. Now. And I wonder what advice or encouragement he's trying to build a culture with dads because he's a pediatrician and he sees the devastating effect of children without fathers. And so he wants to start a ministry of helping fathers know how important it is. You don't need to create you create the wheel. That's what I would say. Don't start, oh no, what am I gonna do? There's um, Steve Wood, 
write his name down on contact me if you need it, that, and it's called dads.org. There's no need to recreate the wheel. He's been doing this as a convert for 30 years, and he works with dads. Dads.org. Start with that. Scott. Yeah, bring some stuff. I mean, this is the kind of thing they actually do. We Catholics need to get involved in doing all these things. Another thing, but just, I, I forgot, not only get rid of the television, but get rid of the iPhones for your kids. My grandkids, none of them have gadgets until they're 18 years old. Yes? So I'm feeling like I completely screwed up my entire life because I've got three sons who left the church. And they did not previously, like, take them to Catholic family land. So it looks like I didn't try. Yep. Yep. Um, but, you know, I'm a preacher with a response, and all of them have rejected it. Now that wasn't the best example because I think he was just standoff. He's good dad. That, that has a big part in it. So she's saying if she feels like a failure because her three sons have left, she tried, took them to Catholic family land, so on, and they're still grounded today, they think she's the crazy mom. You're not the crazy mom, and you have three wonderful sons, so you are not at all a failure. You have three wonderful sons in this world. And that is a marvelous achievement in and of itself. <coughs> Remember, too, that we cannot control it. I've talked as though it's like 100% you can do this. See, I want to make sure you know that's not the case. Because people get friends after they get, even if they go to a good college. They may make friends on a job. They may make friends somewhere else. They may read a book. They, and these, the world is a powerful, powerful influence. Bad company corrupts good morals. Bad philosophy destroys Good philosophy. And people out in the world today and jobs, when they get into a job, Christianity is not the norm anymore. When I was a boy, Christianity was still pretty much the norm. We still said the Pledge of Allegiance at school. We prayed at school. That all quit very fast. But the, And it was not, everybody kind of was a Christian. But now it's the opposite. We are a despised subculture. It's difficult for us to be Catholics in the world. The world tells you to shut up. You can be a Christian, it's stupid to be a Christian, but you do it in your house and you do it in your church and keep it out of the schools and the marketplace and the workplace and keep your mouth shut. And that's the way it is. And if you want to fit in and get along, sometimes you have to reject it. You want to reject it. Now, I'm not going to reject it. I love being countercultural. I love being a rebel with my kids. But not everybody does that. Your sons may have gone out and got a job. And the job where they are, it's permeated with this kind, especially if it's in the media or in entertainment. It's permeated with this hostility to God and to religion and the Catholic Church and our morals. And we Catholics are a bunch of hateful bigots. And so if you're in a job situation like that, and that's the world, and, you, and maybe your father was aloof from you or something, whatever, there are many times it's going to happen. But it doesn't mean it has to persist forever. Because a lot of people go out in the world, and they end up finding it's very meaningless, and it's not fulfilling, and they end up coming back in the long run to the church. You have no reason to believe that you're failure or that they're failures, because they are still all potentials to come back and be reverts into the church. And something may happen. There may be a car accident. There may be another problem. There may be a loss of a job. And all of a sudden, they realize they're not as all uh, self-sustaining as they thought they were. And all it would be amazing. I just out there when I was signing books, the people that came to me and said, I left the faith or I left the Catholic Church and this and this happened and now I'm back. But pray for those guys. They're they're they are goners if you start praying for them. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> I know you pray for them every day. Make the chart from God and tell them. But yes. 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 Oh, my son, I was very honest with him, too. I took him out and I had him watch the goats. <laughs> but I told, I told my son and my daughter, and I do talks in high schools, and I just tell the guys, I said, you, I told my son that guys and girls are very different. Guys are basically controlled by their testosterone. And my wife said to me one time, I wish I could have testosterone like you do for 24 hours so I could understand you better. <laughs> I said, I wish you could too. But I, I, I just told my son that sexual morality is for marriage. Sexual activity is for marriage and not until after. And I, because we made such a big deal of that, all of our kids had chastity rings. 
And we took it to the priest, and the priest would pray for them and put that chastity ring on their finger. And you know, it got me in a lot of trouble sometimes because they knew they could ask whatever kind of ring they wanted. And I would, so my son got one of the diamond and a ruby and gold, and then the other one wants these three diamonds for the Trinity. And how am I going to say no to that? So all of them got some pretty nice rings. But then we had a ceremony with the priest, and they put that on their fingers. And I said, when you get married, I'm going to ask you if you kept your promise to your mother and I am to God. So when I walked my daughter up the aisle, I was crying all the way. I'm t- I will tell you this too, but I walked up the aisle and I turned to her and I said, I held the hand that had that chastity ring on. I said, have you kept your promise to your father, to your mother and I? And she said, I have. So I took her over to Ben Brown, who's also a graduate here. And I said to Ben, I said, my, my daughter has preserved herself pure for you. Do you promise to take care of my daughter? He said, I will, sir. I said, then I'll give you my daughter. What a beautiful thing. And guess what? The next daughter, she was never going to do anything other than that because she was crying and so excited. And she also, all of our daughters did the same thing, three daughters and a son. But it, it's, you, you don't have to necessarily, okay, it's uh, Tuesday morning. We're going to talk about the birds and the bees now. It's more, a lot of times you use teaching moments. Like I did with my daughter with the two bare butts in the back of the window. <laughs> it, you take a moment like that and you... And you talk about it, you know, two rabbits humping in the front yard. I mean, it's just, this is a great moment. <laughs> it really is. Do you know what that boy rabbit's doing? He's impregnating. What do you mean impregnating, Dad? He's got a penis and he's, and, and you've got to just forget the shyness of it all. Just touch, say it like it is. I did with my kids. And they came and asked me questions that would make any person blush because they knew I'd give them an honest answer. I should tell you a couple of questions my daughter's asked me, but I'm not going to. But yes. <laughs> so it sounds like the, the story you know, that your, uh, your nephew was talking about your mother, uh, it sounded like she converted you. Did your father ever? My mother and father never became Catholics, but they were very devout Baptists. I, I learned holiness from my mom and dad as Baptists. I learned how to be a husband and a father for my dad. And they were, to the end of their lives, were devoted to Jesus Christ, although they could never comprehend the Catholic part of it. I could see them sometimes start to understand it, and then I'd see their eyes glaze over. <laughs> so there wasn't a particular thing that was holding them back? Or that they could, it was uh, just in general. My parents had been raised in the, they became a Baptist, they were pagans. They became Baptists in 1953. And they were really into this fundamentalist thing, and there was all anti Catholic stuff. And when you start that from the very beginning, and you're now 70 years old, it's in the marrow of your bones. It's part of your tradition. My mom would even say, there are certain verses in the Bible that don't fit my Baptist belief. So her, she admitted that. The Bible had to fit her Baptist tradition. Her Baptist tradition didn't have to fit the Bible. But to the day of their death, my mom, right up until the end, she's saying, I, I can't wait to get to heaven and see Jesus. He died for my sins. I can't wait to get there and say thank you to him. So she was a very devout Baptist. And that young man, he was also a Baptist. But after I became Catholic... He argued with me all the time at Thanksgiving and so on, but then he told me, he said, Steve, I have to admit, he said, last Thanksgiving after our conversation, I got on, on, on used bookstores and I bought a used copy of your book because I didn't want to buy it from you. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, by the time I got to page 15, I knew you were right, and I was there when him and his wife became Catholics. Wow. So that was good.